we had a downtime recently where our system went down. So all the images that were being captured in the histology lab, they were not available for review for our pathologist. And it was a, the longest downtime we've ever had in the last seven years. It was like 12 hours. Pathologists were crazy. They became mad, they became annoyed. Because say, seven years ago, I told them, when we go digital, you know, you will not use your microscope and they did not believe me. But here we are in 2023. They were complaining that we don't want to go back to the microscope. That was a transformation that I witnessed. I felt bad, I wanted to fix it. And we had colleagues who were working to fix it. And was fixed but that episode made me realize that how dependent have we become on digital pathology welcome my digital pathology trailblazers i do have a very special guest today i'm not going to tell you who that is but if you type well i'm going to tell you later but if you type digital pathology in wikipedia you're going to see his picture uh, he's sitting there in front of his digital pathology cockpit with one screen uh, looking at an image and the other one for typing or something like that if you don't know how he looks you will not know that it's him because the picture is just a picture of him and it doesn't say his name but most of you know how he looks my guest today is Dr. Anil Parwani, the digital pathologist. Welcome to the podcast, Anil. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And I, I'm looking forward to in meeting everyone and interacting with everyone on the on, online. It's so great to have you. I have read many papers of yours and my digital pathology trailblazers as well. But I would love to hear your digital pathology story today. So let's start with your background. How did you get into this area let's start like even before that how did you get from where you come from into where you are right now yeah so my journey re really started with research i was doing research on viruses i in fact worked with covid coronaviruses you know 25 years ago oh, really? when i was in college but i was really excited by technologies i was really excited by what it would involve and bring people together you know for collaboration so when i was starting medical school i i wanted to use technology to help connect with experts so during my first year of residency we started a web series which was digital it was not whole slide imaging it was static images but we were able to connect interesting cases with colleagues around the world and they were able to reach out and connect and ask questions and get gain insights into that disease. You know, the first scanners was just starting to come out. We had one of those at our institute and I started scanning slides and I was amazed by the possibilities that this technology can offer to a patient who is in Saudi Arabia to be able to connect to an expert in the North America or Europe or wherever. And those were the types of things that fascinated me. Those are so I didn't have any formal training. I didn't go to a computer, IT. I don't have, have a background in it, but I was amazed by it. So I started learning about it. And as soon as I finished my residency and I took my pathology boards, I was offered an opportunity to be a pathologist in Pittsburgh, which is where pathology informatics really started. Mm -hmm. And I was in, in the midst of everything. And I remember my first talk, uh, they asked me to present at the API meeting, which is now called Pathology Informatics Summit. They asked me to present on digital pathology. And I predicted at this point, this is 2004, that we're all going to be digital in 2007. <laughs> and here we are in 2023. We are not 100% digital, but amazing leaps have occurred in the field. More people have adopted. And, you know, folks like you are leading this effort in many ways and getting the word out getting this message out and getting people to follow this important field so where i am today now is i worked in pittsburgh for 11 years i worked on implementing a digital pathology solution worked with startup company we built a solution which i think was an amazing solution and it's still being used today but the reason why i came which to solution? my which one uh, so this was the Omnix, which was a mm -hmm. uh, UPMC and GE collaboration. They started a company called Omnix, and I was one of the pathologists involved in that. There were several other pathologists, but we built a software which is still being used today by many pathologists for digital 
pathology slide review and workflow management. They built a scanner, which is still, which was sold at the time, but this opportunity helped me understand digital pathology from a clinical perspective. Also made me understand that when you interact with an image, you don't just interact with an image, you're interacting with a patient and you need all the critical information that's needed to make a diagnosis. But it also made me realize that a glass slide alone is at the end of its life cycle. You know, you can do only so much with a glass slide. But once you digitize it, I can share that image I can bring all the information associated with that image into a workstation. More importantly, I can start to apply computational pathology and AI on that image, which is not possible on a class site. So digital pathology is not new to pathology. You know, it's in the future, it's all going to be pathology. But what is important to understand is there's only so much you can do with a glass slide. And it extends the capability of the information on that glass slide to digitize. You know, imagine if you are in a library and you walk into a shelf and you pick up a book. At that point in time, you are the only one who can read that book. You are the only one who can enjoy that book. You can, you're the only one who can benefit from that book. But imagine if it's digitized, it's on Kindle, it's on Amazon, mm -hmm. it's on you know, social media. Hundreds of people can read the same book simultaneously. So that's really, if you convert that analogy to digital pathology, that's what that digitization brings to the field. Patient care, research, education, collaborations. Those are the things we could not do on a glass slide as easily. We could, we could still do some, but this has really opened up a universe of possibilities for everyone. So that's why I came to my current position when I was offered this role to implement digital pathology at Ohio State University and offered an opportunity to really focus on cancer research, but it really got expanded beyond that. So I've been here for eight years and have wonderful colleagues and a wonderful leadership who has made me bring this technology you know with with the help of a large team into a into a reality which we couldn't have otherwise done mm -hmm. so let's talk about your day so is the whole department digitized the whole pathology department everybody is looking at slides on the computer screen or do you have some instances where you still look at glass so we have some instances where we look, still look at glass right mm -hmm. so we still have issues like I'm a GU pathologist. Mm -hmm. I sign out prostate, kidney, bladder. The only reason I need to go to digital, from digital to glass slide is special slides. I will use whole mounts, mm -hmm. big slides, and we just acquired a scanner to help us with that. But for the most part, most of my work is now digital, but there are occasions when I have a Congo red or mm -hmm. where I have a cytology urine specimen, which is not digitized up front. But I would say, 100% of the pathologists here use digital pathology. I would say 90% of them use it for primary diagnosis. Exclu ex and, Let's talk uh, about that. So you can like bail out 10% don't do it for primary diagnosis. How does that work? For, for valid reasons, right? So mm -hmm. they might have exceptions that they don't have the right technology to help them. So areas which we are lacking is renal path, mm -hmm. which they have not completely converted to digital. Impact, they have not completely converted to digital. We we do digitize all their slides. Mm -hmm. And then cytopath cytopathology is another area. Yes. So we need to we need to buy them appropriate scanners for Z stacking, appropriate scanners for that resolution that they need beyond a 40x, you know, mm -hmm. up to 70x, 80x. Ooh. So those are the things that they uh, they need. They, they, it's, they're not opposed to it. Mm -hmm. I can tell you this. We had a downtime recently where our system went down. So all the images that were being captured in the histology lab, they were not available for review for our pathologist. And it was a, the longest downtime we've ever had in the last seven years. It was like 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And pathologists were crazy. They became mad. They became annoyed because... So seven years ago, I told them, you, when we go digital, you know, you will not use your microscope as they did not believe me. Mm -hmm. But here we are in 2023, in April, May, whenever that happened, they were complaining that we don't want to go back to the microscope. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a transformation that I witnessed. I felt bad. I wanted to fix it. And we had colleagues 
who were working to fix it and it was fixed. It took about a 12 to 15 hours to you know get back to the ground state and it was a sim- it was a silly simple security issue which mm-hmm. could not be resolved between the vendor and the institute. Mm-hmm. But that episode that event made me realize that how dependent have we become on the digital workflow on digital technology. We in our institute this is a clinical system. If it goes down, we call the help desk. Pathologists call the help desk. They have experts there who address these issues as they come. So we've come from a point where we had one scanner, no barcoding. Most pathologists were not interested in using digital pathology to a point where I would lose my job if I didn't bring digital pathology back up more than 12 hours. So that was seven years ago when you joined, you like started basically from scratch or like almost from scratch. We did. and But the, the good news is at that point, we had support from the leadership. We had resources. They were committed to it. And they were committed for research purposes in the beginning. But they soon realized that if we can have pathologists review cases digitally, those cases will become research data. They will, those cases will go into a database where pathologists could review these cases or clinical re- clinical oncologists or even researchers could review these cases in real time. So it became a reality in 2018 where we started signing out digitally for the first time with primary diagnosis. And we, we chose systems which were already FDA approved. But what we have learned from that process is that the technology itself is no longer a barrier. Mm-hmm. We can get image quality, which is equal equivalent or even better in, in some magnifications to the glass side. And pathologists are very, very tuned to it. They are very comfortable with taking those diagnoses and they can make that leap with, without any issues. So it, so we've come to parallel universe where we have, in the beginning, we had 90% pathologists on class slide review and only 10% on digital review. Now we are in a parallel world. We have 90% digital, 10% non-digital. So we're moving into that process, but we don't want to push it. You know, we were probably one of the first institute to go live with digital pathology here, but we didn't push pathologists to do it. We made it grow organically. Mm -hmm. And we wanted, you know, like if you are going to uh, buy a new laptop or a new phone, if you know about it, if you are excited about it, you're more likely to use it to its fullest capability. But if I just gave you a phone because it's cheaper, if it's, you know, like something it's convenient, you are like most likely not going to use it as much. You know, like if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to use it. And that's something about technology, which I've learned over the years. You can't push technology to people. It's all about change management and appropriately implementing the solutions for people to enjoy what they do, love what they do, and be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. So I hear, okay, so the 10% gap is not really the pathologists not wanting to do it. It's just a use case that still needs their equipment, their infrastructure, and like basically the capabilities that the classical 40x, let's call it the classical 40x uh, pathology already has. And recently, I've also heard a story where a big hospital, large hospital was transitioning to digital. They would provide the pathologists both glass and digital slides and let them make the diagnosis on the chosen medium for as long as they wanted. And it took six months to have the last pathologist totally switch from glass to digital. What was the case at Ohio State? So for us, how did you manage the change? Yeah, so for us, we were very early in this adoption cycle, like not just at Ohio State, but nationally. I would say we were one of the first ones who took the chance, brought all this technology, spent almost $10 million to fully output it across the institute. You know, we bought high-end monitors for all pathologists. We bought input devices. We bought storage. Our goal was to get to a point where pathologists would love this technology. It was there was resistance from the financial people. Pathologists are already signing out on a microscope. What added benefit does it bring me? You know, we you are producing a report which is being used by oncologists to treat patients. You are producing a report which is done in a timely manner. Why do you want to introduce a technology which will possibly slow you down? So we had a lot of myths that we had to overcome. You know, the myth of high cost, the myth of delays, the 
limit of even misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we chose to do this organically. We didn't choose to just go live with prostate pathology or sarcoma pathology. We chose to have five or six people who were really passionate about it, who were super users. And as they started using digital sign out, their neighbors, the pathologists who were walking around the corridor, they would see them doing this and they, they were asking, where are your slides? I don't need them. That grew incrementally. But I think the biggest push for us was COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for the whole industry, that was a, like it was a pandemic, but it pushed so many technology advancement forward. And I'm glad that CMS kept the remote sign out and all the advantages that all the digital pathologists basically worked towards during the pandemic to build more proof that this technology is robust and we can rely on it. So yeah, tell me about your pandemic experience at Ohio State. You know, so there was a time, I think it was April, March, April 2020, where we were asked to shut down. Like we could not, mm -hmm. you know, we could not even sit down with one one on one with the residents or fellows or collaborate. And and there were pathologists who were stuck at home because they had childcare issues. They were at risk they had, but at risk to be exposure. We were already had the digital pathology solution in place. So we saw a 22% bump during COVID in adoption. And, you know, from a few pathologists to double digits to in the 20s and S. Yeah, that but still, up. I would think it would go even faster and more because you already had the solution that solved the problem in place. Why only 20%? How so did 20% from develop? where we were. Okay. Not, mm -hmm. just, uh, not, not from zero. Mm -hmm. We already had 10, 12 people. So we saw, we started to see a bump every month, gradually 20% increase. So by 2021, we had 25 pathologists who had signed up. How big is your group? So we have 40 anatomical pathologists mm -hmm. currently. So we saw pathologists were already starting to use digital pathology. They were starting to review their cases remotely. They were able to you know, look at cases and interact with residents and fellows remotely. So we saw a big shift in how we were training residents, how we were teaching residents, how we were triaging cases. So now we are almost at a point where I would love to have the remote pathologists to come back to the office because i still meet i still think digital pathology should not be used as an excuse to not interact with each other right so so that's where we are where most pathologists are digital they're very comfortable they love signing out digitally we've not seen a big difference in discrepancies on a class versus digital and some of the pathologists are mostly digitally signing out and they're signing out remotely for the frozen sections and review of materials. So we've seen a large shift in the de demographics of who signs out digitally, where are they signing out? But on the flip side, I still think we need to keep that engagement alive. We need to have pathologists in, you know, interact with one another in live, in person, you know, post-COVID. So that's the challenge that I'm dealing with because they love the technology. They don't see a reason to come to the office and sign up. Mm -hmm. But we have many pathologists who have are using the digital remote review as a way to triage cases. But at the end, they will come back to the office and you know sign out the cases, teach the residents and the fellows. So we're going through a transitional period right now. Mm -hmm. Do you see more interest in taking pathology as a specialty because of the advantages that digital pathology gives? Do you have like more applications because digital pathology is now an option or have you have not seen any influence on that yet? So what you're asking is how does digital pathology promote more people to go into pathology? Yes, yes, exactly. And if you have seen like a tangible change, positive change in that, I mean, because... Absolutely. Yeah. You so have, what, I've, what I've seen is in the United States today, if you look at pathology residency statistics, I think we have about 560 residency slots every year mm -hmm. for pathology residents to apply, for medical students to apply for residency. In the last five years, we've seen a decline in the number of U.S. medical students going into pathology. So of all the 500 plus positions, 40% of those positions are not filled by U.S. medical graduates. Okay. So, but they're filled by foreign graduates. 
it's not that it's they like, like there are any empty right there is no empty okay stock, okay right? you know like luckily there is a competition at the end of the people scramble they apply for those positions but what we've seen in the last two years or so is more u.s medical students are looking patho- at pathology as a career mm-hmm. in my institute we have several new electives and courses that we offer to trainees you know i have a student right now who is working with me he's from the school of engineering and he has been working and building algorithms with me all summer and he's brilliant but and i asked him why don't you want to go into pathology i had even i had not even known about that as a possibility as a career mm-hmm. and now he's interested so there are many national efforts to improve the recognition of pathology as a career which is cool right if you think about pathology think as very cool. as a pathology is super cool being pathologist yeah, I, i think we are super cool too and we are very tech savvy more than people think we are i can teach a few things to my kids about smartphones and databases that they don't know but they don't believe that <laughs> but but at the end of the day we have more medical students and graduate students and undergraduates who are intrigued by pathology or interested in joining a career in pathology we're offering courses and digital pathology is the perfect solution to engage more and more people because i always tell people like if you're looking at a slide you're looking at it around if you're looking at an image the possibilities are endless research education collaboration it just opens up a new whole new world for you so we have seen many more applications now and this year for the first time in the last 5 years we had all us medical graduates medical students match into our program and speaking to other programs around the country we they are seeing the seeing the same trend so pathology perception of pathology and digital pathology is changing for from a training perspective from an education perspective and i think it's going to take us to a point where digital pathology will just be part of a modern pathology department this will drive clinical volume this will drive education this will drive research and we would be for the first time be able to engage at a very global level with pathologists around the world looking at the same cases sharing ideas learning from each other which would not be possible on glass slides right when i was a resident we had to go to a conference and somebody would take the kodachrome slides with them and present this unusual case and today on twitter i can see it within seconds or on your on your website on your post yes. you know this the world has changed tremendously and you know like i had come from a world where when i was a resident i only had one hour lecture mm-hmm. on how to turn on a computer and turn it off i am in a world now where i am personally learning how to code how to do data visualization how do i you know i can actually write code now which i what, could not what language are you coding in i'm, I'm, I'm looking at i've been learning r i've been learning python mm-hmm. in my college i learned some basic fortran pascal but now i'm learning the current languages but the point is if you don't think about it you will not know about it if you don't know about it you're not going to use it you're not going to implement it mm-hmm. so the perfect way to move forward is to understand the limitations of the technology understand the benefits of the technology that brings me to uh, to another question because you mentioned at the beginning you were heavily involved in the create in the creation of a software solution for digital pathology why did you choose to stay in academia rather than join the industry or how are you involved in the industry because you're super involved everywhere so tell me the story about that yeah so so i had an opportunity i have had several opportunities to join industry you know be part of an industry which is growing incrementally but i love to teach i love to interact with residents and fellows i love to you know to take an idea and implement it. and if i was in industry i see that barrier between the industry and academia is always there it's getting better now mm mm-hmm. really defined but i saw that as a barrier to you know i thought i was if i was on this side of the fence i would be more impactful mm-hmm. if i joined the industry i would probably work for a company you know i would probably maybe achieve, become a chief medical officer for a company and you know advise that company and maybe make it successful but i would be only focusing on one product for one company 
and the impact will be limited. Personally, I would probably gain a lot more financially working for the industry. But if I'm on this side of the fence, I can still work with companies with mm-hmm. a very well-defined industry academic engagement, disclose it, mm-hmm. and work in the confines of those boundaries, but impact it more broadly. You know, like I can now compare three products, yes. software products, which are making an algorithm for prostate cancer detection in the confines of a research environment mm-hmm. in an academic setting. So, I mean, that's the reason why I chose to. I love to teach. I love to interact with. That That was the reason why I stayed in the, in, in the academic setting. So a different question. Do you use AI in a different than a research setting? Do you use it for your daily practice, pathology practice? And what AI are you using if you are? Yeah, so I personally, I'm a GU pathologist. So the only AI that I've been using and testing is mostly right now prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. We have used AI, we built algorithms at our university for bladder cancer. And I've also worked with collaborators at different institutes to building kidney cancer recognition and classification. In the clinical setting, we are mostly using AI for ordinary tasks like detecting lymph nodes, cancer mats in lymph nodes, or finding H. pylori in gastric biopsies, or quantitating ER, PR, HER2 neo. So those are the things that we have implemented at our institute because I'm a GU pathologist. I don't use many of those in my daily mm-hmm. practice, but I've been involved in implementing them, helping, working with our other pathologists and colleagues to bring those solutions. What I'm most excited about the possibilities of using broader algorithms, not just a disease specific algorithms. Like, so I've been working with colleagues at Mayo Clinic and other places to build algorithms which would classify you know, an unknown image into a known disease or a known cancer. So if you're almost like a Google approach where I take an image or the computer takes an image of a region of interest, feeds it into an algorithm and gives you the differential diagnosis. I mean, that's how we learned as pathologists. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was a resident, I would look at a tumor on under the microscope. I didn't know what it was. I would start flipping through pages. And it was very cumbersome, took a long time, and I was almost always wrong. But today we have technologies which I can just press a button and compare that image and search for similar images in a database. So the answer to your question is, I don't use it a whole lot today because I still feel with my expertise in prostate pathology, I can do better than the algorithm in many ways, but I also like the fact that it can bring more efficiency into my workflow. Mm-hmm. So if you look at my, you know, we talked about my office, yes. I have three monitors and I have one which I use for reporting, one used to for all the images that I review, and the third one is for all these conversations that we have about digital pathology and emails and work. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so many pathologists at our institutes are now using AI algorithms, and they're using it with either solutions that they purchased, we purchased off the shelf, or something we've been building here, here at OSU. But it, but I would say we are not to the point where we are using AI routinely. I, w- I would say it will take us about a year or two to get there mm-hmm. okay. to incorporate it fully into our workflow. And then it's not something that's under our control. It's more under the control of the interfaces and the mm-hmm. user experience and the consoles or the workstations that we're looking at. All the vendors who build build scanners. They're acquiring images. All the vendors who build AI solutions, they're building great solutions, but they're not talking to each other every day. And that's where you come in. You need to bring them together. I need to do that. So, Anil, before we finish, if um, there was not like, let's do one one piece of advice for somebody who wants to start in digital pathology, one for uh, an individual and one for institution, what would that be? I think the biggest thing to do is Think about your workflow today. What are you doing today? How can digital pathology help you? You know, you might be a dermatopathologist and you are, majority of your cases are basal cell carcinoma. And, you know, you might want to buy a solution which is not dependent on high throughput scanning or buying a particular AI, but focusing on that one problem which will save 20% of your time every day. 
Mm -hmm. So my rule is 20%. Think about a solution which will help you to save 20% of your time. And it could be scanning, it could be remote sign out, it could be doing frozen remotely, where you have to travel somewhere for 20 minutes. Focus on one thing, focus on the low hanging fruit, focus on the biggest impact that one dollar that you have to spend will have. And I see large digital pathology projects across many institutes, and they're focused on going live on July 1 mm -hmm. with everything, and they get delayed. They get delayed and delayed and delayed, and that impetus, the impact, the momentum is lost. So pick one thing which you are most excited about as an individual. Convey it to your institute. Buy people's buy-in. Get them to be excited about that same one thing. It could be, I want to review all my amino stains remotely. I need to buy this scanner. It will take me this time. Make it a finite problem. Make it a smart goal. Mm -hmm. Make it something which is achievable, measurable in real time, and it produces a result. You know, set expectations which are realistic. And I see that why digital pathology projects fail. It's because we try to overachieve. Mm -hmm. Your goal should be underachieved. Your goal should not be, I'm going to be this institute who is completely digital. Your goal should be, I'm going to be this institute, this hospital, this lab, which will solve this problem. And digital pathology will help me get there. And then you can incrementally build on it. Mm -hmm. And we are the perfect example. We didn't start with 100% sign out. We didn't start with the goal to you know, achieve this in two years. Our goal was to incrementally build a solution, mm -hmm. which people are excited about. Because if people are not excited, you know, like if I'm going to just say July 1, everybody is digital. It's your my way or highway. Nobody will, nobody will buy it. Mm -hmm. Everybody will leave Ohio State and go somewhere else. I love the advice that it should be problem, like solution oriented rather than like some achievement base. I think often, like you say, we try to overachieve and fail. And then the perception is, oh, the whole digital pathology initiative fails. And maybe it was just, you know, one problem or 50% or of whatever you um, set out to achieve was achieved. But from the outside, from people who are not involved in this, and often these are decision makers, this looks like a failure and they don't want to embark on this journey anymore. So framing it as, okay, we're solving this one problem that's going to give us 20% more of our time, revenue or whatever. It's a very sustainable way and, you know, gives people the feeling of accomplishment and the motivation to try the next 20%, the next 20%. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining me today. It was an honor and a pleasure to have the digital pathologist on the podcast. Uh, and so, so if somebody wants to ask you questions, what's the best way to contact you? I, I love emails. Mm -hmm. So if you want to send me an email, I'm very good at responding emails and be persistent. So if I don't answer the first email, follow it by a second email. And I promise you, I will answer. Okay, so rather uh, email than social media. Social media works well. LinkedIn is my preferred okay. social media, but I can go. I haven't joined Threads yet. Not yet. But, <laughs> but maybe we'll start a Threads in uh, right. I'm gonna. You probably have already started it. I, I started, yes. <laughs> and TikTok. So if somebody wants to find me there, you can. And I'm definitely going to link to your LinkedIn profile. And uh, whoever wants to start the conversation can reach out there. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you so much as well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in for the full episode. If you stay till the end, it means you are a real digital pathology trailblazer. And I have a special gift for you. We have set up at Digital Pathology Place a special membership site, Digital Pathology Club. It's a library of all the courses that we have, including pathology one-on-one -on -one for tissue image analysis, marketing for digital pathology, AI and pathology, and we're working on glassless pathology right now. All the courses are there and there's there's also a community that you can join and network. And I would love to offer you a free one week trial to check what's out there and start learning and taking your digital pathology knowledge to the next level. So click the link below to grab your free trial. And I talk to you in the next episode.